Um, okay, hi everyone. I think we have a, a good number of attendees so far, so we can start this session. Um, so welcome to the third session on last session of this day on the symposium on occupant behavior. This session will be on modeling and simulation, and we'll have three presentations of eight minutes uh, with one minute for a, a question after each, and then we will have four presentations of three minutes, and at the end there will be um, 25 minutes for a panel discussion between the presenters. To all the attendees, if you want to submit questions for the presenters, please use the Q&A panel. Um, and also, if you're not submitting questions, just feel free, free to browse for the questions and upvote those that you think are most important. Um, and without further ado, I'll give the floor to the first presenter, which is Miklas Horvath, and he will be presenting on occupant behavior profile development based on smart meter data. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay, perfect. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Miklos Horvath, and I'm going to give the first presentation of this session. So I would try to start uh, into it. First, I'd like to mention some things about smart meters in Hungary. There was a project called Central uh, Smart Grid Pilot Project in, uh, starting from 2016, where uh, nearly 140,000 smart meters were installed in different building types, um, residential, public, commercial, measuring several uh, uh, different points, including electricity, uh, gas, heat, and water, and the sampling time varies from five minutes to one week. Uh, I'm part of a research group, um, and the project title is uh, this long here. We have been uh, presenting in Perugia in uh, September 2019. The aim of the project is to analyze the data collected in this um, pilot project because they only wanted to, to test how they can install the meters, but they are not analyzing the data. So we are aiming at um, uh, different objectives. We would like to develop uh, occupant energy profile uh, profiles for different uh, building types and households. And we would like to enhance and support uh, the national uh, building typology system. And also we would uh, like to help policymakers to, to, to make better decisions. And uh, we also would like to identify clusters um, for occupants based on their consumption, uh, including uh, social demographic uh, parameters as well. Firstly, I would uh, talk a bit about the meters. Uh, on this slide, you can see uh, how many meters were installed in the residential uh, sector. As you can see here, the meters were mainly installed in central and southern Hungary, including two cities from the east. Um, <clears throat> a total of 1,800 meters were approximately uh, installed so far. We identified uh, usable data from uh, 5,400, and we did a geographical survey uh, of 1,300 uh, buildings. <clears throat> However, I have to mention that uh, distribution of settlement types in Hungary is uh, nearly equal to capital, village, town, and city. However, the meters are installed in a different manner, so uh, <clears throat> we can um, somehow still uh, give the representativity for the different settlement types, however, we cannot uh, make the representativity working for the whole country in case of residential buildings. In case of uh, non-residential buildings, we still have a lot to go. Uh, first, we started with uh, the natural gas uh, consumption. From this, we have uh, a bit over 1,000 um, uh, data. And here we first grouped um, uh, the buildings uh, based on their activities. We have a lot of educational buildings, uh, primary and secondary schools, also administration buildings. So we would be able to, to have some uh, qualitative uh, data out of these. As for the methods, <clears throat> uh, as I mentioned before, we made uh, mapping, GIS mapping. Uh, it was chosen um, <clears throat> because uh, going to um, uh, check all the buildings would be really time and uh, um, effort to do. So we had to make a compromise between the accuracy and uh, the time spent on it. Also, we were trying to get 
uh, information on the building function type, area, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we were uh, making subcategorization based on the building archetypes uh, based, uh, for the previously developed uh, national building uh, typologies. We also had some problems with the street view images because they were not available everywhere, and uh, sometimes it was like. Uh, nearly impossible or at least very difficult to, to identify the buildings. <clears throat> uh, as for the evaluation methods, um, we use uh, time series analysis and clustering. Uh, we started with natural uh, gas consumption and electricity. First, uh, we developed a data filtering uh, method to discard the unusable or false data sets. First, we check the data manually and uh, we identified typical errors, but I will talk about this one later. And then we, we developed algorithms to automatically uh, categorize the time series. So we are not uh, using manual uh, labor to, to do it. And also we tried uh, three types of clustering methods uh, already. <clears throat> the other section would be uh, dynamic building simulation. Here we already uh, progress with two uh, non-residential buildings. One is an office building, the other one is a kindergarten, and we have diff diff uh, developed different models, um, aka simple and detailed uh, models, and we were checking the model accuracy in case of these um, buildings, and uh, we found that it's really important to to uh, have a balance between the detailed and the si uh, simplified methods, because they can uh, give a uh, a uh, big <clears throat> difference in the results. For example, in case of uh, the HVAC system from 15 to 25% difference between the measured and the model data. Uh, as for the questionnaires and interviews, we are planning three uh, rounds of data collection, one uh, in public buildings without smart meters, one in public buildings with smart meters. These uh, questionnaires were already uh, held. However, with the households, we are only planning to, to do surveys uh, with the, where the smart meters are uh, also in, uh, installed. And we have, <clears throat> we're going to check the different variables so we can um, evaluate uh, the results better. As for the results of the um, public buildings, um, as I mentioned, we were uh, doing some beta filtering. So we checked um, some time series, this cumulative time series for typical errors, including um, buildings with like no consumption or big jumps in the data or missing data. So where we don't have at least one year data, we discarded them. And uh, <clears throat> based on our uh, manual uh, checks, uh, we developed uh, an algorithm and we found uh, usable data for 67 school buildings, and I would present uh, you the first clustering results in this um, aspect. So <clears throat> on these graphs, you can um, uh, see the relative consumption of two buildings for different month. So these are the daily profiles for the different month. And on the left, you can see that in the summer month, where there is uh, close to none, uh, no consumption, we can assume that here in these buildings only um, the gas is only used for <clears throat> heating, but here it also used for uh, producing, for example, possibly domestic hot water. So <clears throat> we made uh, clusters and we tried uh, to establish the optimal number of clusters. So. Uh, we used the silhouette and the elbow methods, and uh, we did it uh, for the summer month, where we um, found that <clears throat> if we make four clusters, here you can see in the fourth cluster, there is close to none um, possible domestic hot water consumption, while in the other profiles, there should be some uh, other consumption than heating. So when we uh, further uh, clustered uh, these buildings, in case where there was no uh, domestic hot water consumption, we could use just two clusters, <clears throat> uh, in one of which we had a morning peak, in the other one we had a more or less stable uh, daily uh, consumption. 
but uh, in case of uh, uh, schools, be it possible, uh, domestic hot water consumption, the, um, the um, results are, are very, very similar. So as you can see, there's also one where there is a bigger morning peak and the other one is more or less stable consumption during the day. And as to conclude uh, my presentation, so <clears throat> we can uh, uh, achieve some representative, uh, representativeness for uh, the settlement ties, ties, but not for the, the whole country. The biggest problem uh, is the GDPR with the residential buildings. Also, we are experiencing some serious data quality issues, as you could see, like uh, maybe 10% of the data was usable so far. And <clears throat> in the public buildings, we can uh, analyze, the, analyze in more details because we would have more uh, data on them. And as for the clustering analysis, we are uh, wondering if uh, there are other clustering methods that you could uh, recommend. And also, like, is there a better way to determine the optimal number of clusters? Or is there like um, more use, uh, more accepted way, I would say. <clears throat> and also, uh, how can we determine the optimal fuzziness parameters for the, for the uh, positivians methods? And basically, thank you very much for your attention. I, I hope I didn't leave you out of my time. Thank you, Miklas. For the, for you are only two minutes over, so <laughs> we're still OK. Um, so I'll take one question from the Q&A panel. Uh, it says, please, could you explain why only a small percentage of residential dwellings had usable smart meter data? Um, sorry, once again? If you could explain why only a small percentage of the residential dwellings um, had usable um, smart meter data. Well, basically, uh, as I mentioned during the presentation, uh, the problem is that uh, there are uh, so the, the project where they installed the smart meters was a pilot project of uh, seeing uh, different, uh, seeing and evaluating different types of meters. And they were mostly interested in how they can install them. And they never really checked the data and this data check we are doing. So that's why uh, the quality is sort of so bad of the data. But we are trying to get as much out of it as possible. OK, thank you. Um, we have more questions, but we'll We'll do them later in the panel discussion. So now we go to our next presenter, uh, Mohamed Uf. Um, the topic of this talk is analyzing smart thermostat data and unregulated loads to support the Canadian net zero energy ready code. So Mohamed, if I can ask you to share your screen. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. We are. Okay, we are. We are not seeing the presentation, though. We see your. Right. Um, yeah. I'll... Put it there we go. Perfect. Second. Okay. Yeah, should be good. All right. So, uh, hello, everyone, and uh, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, so, my name is Mohamed Ouf. I am an assistant professor at uh, Concordia University in Montreal, Canada. And uh, this presentation on, is uh, on a project we're doing for analyzing smart thermostat data and the impact of unregulated loads on uh, building simulations. And that's for the Canadian Net Zero Energy Code. Um, so without getting or wasting too much time on the background and details, there is currently a project uh, by the National Research Council of Canada on uh, updating building codes for meeting net zero energy targets. And one of the things or outcomes of all of the research that has been happening over the past while is that they're realizing that with more stringent code requirements, the impact of occupants will be much more uh, significant. So the goal of this work was to do two things. One of them is to evaluate the current occupant-related assumptions in the current Canadian Energy Code versus uh, data coming from existing buildings. And then the second part was to see if we can uh, use the data from existing buildings to evaluate the effect of uh, previous code changes on uh, the thermal performance of the building stock. For the sake of time, I'm just going to present the first goal in this uh, presentation. And uh, in order to do that evaluation, we used two main data sources. So the first is the EcoB data set that was mentioned before. And for Canada, there's about 14,000 uh, houses that are covered across the map, as you can see here. 
and then for the plug loads analysis, we try to look for existing uh, literature and specifically if there's any existing raw data sources that we could uh, use to look into plug loads assumption in existing buildings. The objectives were to include uh, or to investigate thermostat set point preferences across Canada, identify heating and cooling set point profiles from this data set and then investigate the impact of uh, plug loads analysis on simulations. So the first part of the analysis was building on some previous work that was actually looking into that a uh, little bit. But so what we did was more of a high level analysis of the average thermostat set points in uh, different houses in the country. And what we found or what we focused on was the um, set points when the mode is on heating or cooling and for two, like for basically daytime versus nighttime uh, schedules. And we found that most or almost 80% of the data points within that huge data set were actually falling into those categories. So that was a good way to filter out uh, or to just focus on those main categories of data. And then using this data, we developed an average 24 uh, hour heating and cooling set point profile for each house in that data set. Uh, one of the potential limitations and one of the main issues that come up whenever we talk about EcoB data is how representative is it? So there's a lot of arguments on the fact that it's not randomly sampled. These are people that voluntarily share their data and uh, that users are also representing higher income brackets, more tech savvy and so on. So we don't know if actually whatever we do with this data set is representative of the actual building stock. So to address these limitations, we tried to do two things. One of them was to only focus our analysis on provinces that had at least 500 thermostats. So like Clayton mentioned previously, we're trying to have as much data so that we'll try to avoid some of the noises within uh, these data sets. And then the second part was that we compared the results with the Canadian survey for household energy use. So that is administered by, by Statistics Canada in a more statistically sound way. However, the method is a little bit different because users or respondents to that survey just report what thermostat set point they usually put for each mode. So it's not as detailed in terms of data, but it's a good reference point. So to do this, when we looked at the heating set point uh, distribution across the three provinces, which happen to be also the three most populous provinces in Canada, Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec, the heating set point distribution was somewhat similar between the two data sets, and that gave us some good validation, at least of the data set we're working with. Uh, when we looked at cooling, the situation wasn't exactly the same, so there were some differences. And one of the main things was um, the fact that the SHU data or the survey data that comes from Statistics Canada only reports um, cooling set points for 23 degrees and above. So anything that's above that is just reported in one bracket. So that's why you always see those jumps in that uh, area or and on the 23 degrees Celsius, and that represents even more than 23. Uh, but because we have a lot more granular data with ECOB, we're able to actually see the distribution beyond 23 degrees Celsius, which we think is more reasonable for, um, for cooling uh, set points. Um, using this data, so after we've done this validation, let's say at the beginning, we uh, came up with those 24 hour um, heating and cooling set point profiles for each house. And we did a K, like a K shape clustering, which is a variation of the K means clustering algorithm to look at that data set for the, for, for the I think what remained in those three provinces was something in the range of 10,000 houses uh, to look at their 24 hour uh, heating and cooling profiles and to see how can we can cluster them. So we identified that four clusters was the most appropriate. And we basically came up with four heating set point clusters or profiles and four cooling set point profiles for Canada. What was interesting is that 60% or almost 60% of the houses in both situations had a daytime heating and cooling setback. So for heating that meant a lower heating set point during the day. So that's cluster one, two, and four. And then for cooling set points, that meant a higher cooling set point during the day. And that's because most of the houses belonged to clusters one and two. So when we compare this with the code assumptions or the current code assumptions, uh, there were quite some significant differences. So first of all, the code actually assumes that there's a heating, uh, an increase in heating set point during the day rather than a decrease, which we saw in more than 60% of the houses. And the cooling set point is assumed to be constant, but that's actually also not the case. We do see a setback uh, or an increase in cooling set point during the day. 
Uh, the code assumptions also, although we found four different clusters or four different groups, there's no variation. So these set point assumptions that are used in the code are the same for all climate zones, housing types, and floor areas, and so on. So in order to investigate this a little bit more, we uh, developed a random forest model to see if we can predict which house would belong to which cluster. And uh, with that uh, random forest model, what we really wanted to see is what is the impact of the different attributes about those houses that influence their um, heating and cooling set point preferences. What we found, not surprisingly, was that the outdoor temperature, which is measured from the nearest weather station, was the most uh, significant parameter in most cases. And that's that kind of indicates that possibly climate zones can have an effect. And that was also uh, shown in some previous studies by uh, Brent Hutchak and others. Uh, there's also the, uh, the fact that building age was also quite significant. And that's probably representative of the actual thermal properties and thermal mass envelope efficiency of the houses, and that did have an effect on uh, the cooling and heating set point preferences. The uh, second part of that work was looking at uh, plug loads assumptions, so the plug load profiles that are used in the code compared to what is coming from actual uh, buildings data. So as I mentioned before, we did take raw data and developed three scenarios for, different, for three different building types using data that's existing in the literature. Um, so, and then at that point, what we did was uh, develop those three scenarios and plug them into the archetype models that are used for code compliance for these three building types. So some of the interesting observations we found is that the, uh, the current energy code assumptions for plug loads may be overestimating EUI uh, in, across the board, especially um, for, for office buildings and others. That, and also that the impact, and that was also one of the most interesting findings, is that the impact of plug loads assumption does increase with newer codes. So that is validating the, the need for revisiting those assumptions that really haven't changed since the 80s to say that if we're gonna go for a net zero energy code or more stringent requirements, this trend of increasing the impact of plug loads um, assumptions will actually be even more. And uh, finally, which is not, uh, which is kind of expected anyways, that the impact of plug loads assumption was also um, consistently higher in milder climates versus um, colder climates within Canada. Um, I'd like to find, finish this with uh, thanking uh, my team that has been working on this and also the financial support that we got from the National Research Council of Canada for the, this work. Thank, Thank you. you very much for the, the presentation. Um, I think I see a question uh, from Colson Anderson. It says, the heating set points seem quite low. Do you have any information on the actual temperature? Um, so the heating set points uh, in here. So that's actually a good point. So in, um, we do have the the actual temperature data, and that uh, for this data set, we d we were interested more in this case to look at the heating set points specifically because that was what we were asked to do. I think that's something that we can. Um, I I'll just to be frank, like we don't have a specific answer to that right now. I don't think we uh, looked too much on the differences between the two. Uh, but we looked at that for another part of the project to see like the difference between indoor and outdoor temperature and uh, that was to analyze the thermal properties. So um, that's a good point. I, I think we, we have to look at why um, or if there is a significant difference between the set point and the actual temperature. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll go to the... Victoria, you're muted. Sorry, thank you for letting me know. Um, so I, I was saying we will go, thank you, Mohammed, for, for your presentation. And we'll go to the next presenter, which is Ardesh Madavi, uh, presenting on agent-based modeling of building occupants, promise and challenges. Hi, my name is Madavi, and together with my colleague uh, Christiane Berger from TU Vienna, we recently conducted a review study of work in agent-based modeling. As you know, agent-based modeling has uh, quite a um, um, quite a uh, um, history in with regard to the built environment. However, most of the uh, studies have been with regard to issues such as um, 
fire safety or uh, occupant evacuation and means of egress, we were interested to uh, inquire about the studies that explicitly address the indoor environment and also energy performance of buildings. As you are uh, familiar, many colleagues uh, consider that the conventional way of representing occupants in buildings is rather simplistic, uh, schedule-based uh, representations, for instance. And so the idea is that we should have better means of representing the dynamics, the complexity, the high resolution of occupants, patterns of presence and actions in buildings. There have been many methods uh, pursued in recent years, uh, specifically probabilistic methods, thereby, of course, agent-based modeling offer itself, I think, also as a probably adequate formalism in that uh, direction. So uh, I don't think I need to talk about agent-based modeling method as such, you're mostly familiar with it. Sorry, excuse me. I, I'm sorry to stop you for a moment, but I'm getting a lot of comments that people cannot hear you properly. Um, so if you can get closer to your microphone, sorry to stop you, but just many people are saying that they're not uh, hearing well. Okay, is it better so uh, you hear me better? Um, I can hear you fine, but let's see what people say in the chat. I think uh, no, so I don't know whether you can get closer to the microphone or... I guess I'm as close as possible. Okay. I will try to speak a bit louder. Okay, so, thank you. Uh, basically, uh, the uh, agent-based modeling as a formalism is uh, known to uh, most of you. So the idea is to represent these patterns of presence of behavior, not in terms of procedural codes, but to embody those, so to speak, in the behavioral repertoire of individual agents that represent the individual occupant. Um, the general format is that we need to somehow capture the behavior of people. Typically in that area, we need to re uh, rely on behavioral sciences. On the other side, we have to also represent the physical factors of the environment, the buildings itself, the systems with which the occupants um, uh, engage in uh, interactions. And we look at what are the existing works in that area before, uh, so to speak, embarking on new studies. Our, uh, Search was limited uh, to about last 10 years, uh, from 2010 to 2018. We looked at different ways of uh, trying to figure out what papers would be relevant. And from those uh, papers that were generally in this area, specifically 23 publications were found to be immediately and directly relevant. So the questions that uh, we ask ourselves are what was the purpose behind the implementation of these uh, works of research, what methods of representation did they pursue, and what kind of implementation tools they use. And I share with you some, a few of the uh, respective results. So altogether, if you want, the general review was structured in terms of this matrix of these dimensions. Uh, with regard to implementation tools here, you can see the uh, those that used in order to represent the occupants. You can see some of the usual suspects in this area, NetLogo, AnyLogic, uh, Repass, Symphony, and so on. Some people even use tools such as MATLAB. With regard to the implementation tools for the environment, these tools are specifically not agent-based, but they're typically procedural codes that most of us use uh, when we do basically indoor environmental analysis and basically building performance simulation. So those are the typical that even in this platforms that are meant for agent-based modeling are typically deployed. So the central question for us was, what is the main source of domain knowledge? So the colleagues who uh, developed these platforms, how do they, so to speak, capture the uh, people's behavior and represent it in terms of computational code? And if you think about three basic categories, what are the underlying theories behind the presumed uh, patterns of occupant behavior? Where does the source of information come from? Is it from theoretical background? Is it just literature that is embedded in codes and standards and guidelines that planners typically use? Or is it original data? And we try to uh, do analysis, if you want, of those. And we start with the percentage of uh, publications that are specifically and exclusively based on codes and standards, they're about 40%. Uh, 
so that's all they use in order to capture uh, uh, the behavior of occupants. Uh, if you look at the original data, relatively a small percentage do that, that at least for one building, some data is collected in order to develop the model in specific rare cases, also to try to validate the model. And there are various percentage of combinations, for example, theory with original measured data or theory uh, based information with case based information and uh, other forms of uh, combination. So if we actually try to summarize this result in a more succinct way, we can suggest that something like less than one third of all these publications use any kind of behavioral theory. I mean with that some form of assumption, either be causal or data-driven theories such as theory of uh, plant behavior or any kind of theory. So a very small number have any kind of explicit theoretical underpinning for their uh, inquiries. Less than 40%, uh, about 40% rely exclusively on codes and standards and guidelines and typical information uh, accessible to planners. And as I mentioned before, less than 13% use any kind of original measured data from the buildings that they try to model. So those buildings are modeled in terms of a, so to speak, formalistic representation and to explore the possibilities of algorithm, but they are not based on, so to speak, authentic information. In a few cases, some information is collected either through monitoring in case possible, and sometimes just basic on some kind of occupant survey of in which uh, type of situations do you do what kind of behavior and, uh, and so on. So let me, so to speak, summarize all of that. And we could suggest that uh, in principle, there is quite a significant promise in agent-based modeling technique, which is to me somewhat surprisingly uh, seems to be somewhat underused if we think about the application cases in indoor environmental analysis or energy performance analysis. Theoretically, we could represent the dynamic nature, uh, the, uh, so to speak, uh, difficult to put in schedule nature of behavior of occupants. Uh, we can uh, enrich the possibilities of simulation tools in, in terms of being able to look at this variability of occupant behavior and, uh, and represent those. But we face also a number of challenges. Most of it is that we have, uh, there is a paucity of uh, empirical information regarding occupant's behavior, perception, evaluation processes, and behavior. And we see also in the current uh, publication thus far, very rarely a systematic model validation effort. It means that we have so much fun developing these uh, platforms from the pure formalism point of view that we don't spend enough time to also see, okay, are they actually capable on replicating? I'm not even talking about predicting, but replicating observational data, if you can get on hands on observational data. So what we think that for future, we should try to uh, not only further enhance the, uh, what's, let's say the algorithmic powers or the user interface and basically the connectivity of these type of tools, but we also need to do much more in the direction of collaborative studies, maybe international level studies, where we can uh, develop and accumulate a richer body of observational data that can be used both to develop these type of agent-based modeling environments, but also to, to a certain degree validate and uh, have, a, a, let us say, a higher degree of confidence in those results. For those of you who might be interested in further details about this study that I could only uh, uh, refer to in, in, in a very short version, there is a, a publication uh, that uh, is uh, available online, so you are very welcome to uh, consult that. Uh, that's for me. Thank you for your attention and uh, warm greetings from the end. Thank you. Thank you for that very nice presentation. Um, I think we have a question. So um, what role do you think open data and sharing research data can play in the ability to build domain knowledge to train agent-based models? I think that's exactly uh, the point I was trying to make. It's an excellent point. Uh, what we feel is that our capabilities in order to develop these environments 
currently surpass the richness of the empirical data that we have in order to actually test and refine and validate this environment. So development of uh, databases, having sources of open source data, some of us are working in that area, as you might know, would be a, a great, I think, benefit generally to anybody who's interested in occupant-centric building design and operation, or that, that more, so to speak, comprehensive and rich body of information would support any kind of activity in this area, but it would specifically enrich the, if you want, informational background, the repertoire of how we represent people's behavior, preferences, evaluation processes, psychological responses, all of that in these type of platforms uh, that allow us to, to model these processes. Thank you. I think we, we have a lot um, to talk during the discussion then. Um, so now we'll go to the three minute presentations. Um, these presentations, they're, they're all continuous, so we'll leave all the questions for after for later. Uh, we'll start with Clarice, who will presenting uh, inserting occupant behavior models within the workflow of practitioners, a practice-based perspective. Hi, I'm not sure you can see my full screen. Can you hear me properly? We can hear you if you can put the presentation in. Yes, in slideshow. Yeah, Perfect. that's fine. Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> So we present a practice-based perspective for inserting occupant behavior models within the workflow of practitioners, more specifically building designers. Um, we understand that designers need to make decisions which are incomplete, having complete information and also multiple goals from my aesthetic to imposed by client. Uh, besides that, they solve problems by reflecting in action through a conversation with the materials of the situation, that is, with the drawings. So we recognize that designers always ask questions about the building, how it performs, how it can be made better, what options the designer has for developing it, etc. We deconstruct and formalize potential questions such that they can be encoded in a database and recalled by the simulation user. And the database contains, in theory, all the questions that one can ask about the building performance and contains all the knowledge, the answers, on strategies for analyzing and improving performance. So this is a diagram of our proposed framework with the following dimensions encoded in a data model. So the goals of simulation, which go from understanding performance up to assessing a product, meeting a target, etc. Types of analysis, which can be descriptive, just comparisons, uh, optimizing sensitivity tests, etc. Uh, types of actions designers can have, building parameters that they can change during the design process, types of metric, types of interaction with, of simulation user with data and types of dif display. So we can then formalize what uh, was discussed into a simulation workflow. The software user inputs his or her question. The question triggers specific model settings, simulation settings and analytical processes to be run to aid in the decision making. The answer to the question is then provided through a simulation post-process output, which is displayed at an overview level, but is also uh, possible to enable the user interaction with the data through different types of zoom and filtering systems. An individual design process should then be supported by flexibility in the sequence in which these questions or this information is requested and delivered. And uh, it should support any sequence of questions. So you have two different examples here. And that's why we propose a kind of a modular system. Now, once a database of, of questions is created and formal simulation workflows can be created for each different type of question, useful sequences of questions can be identified and recorded in a database as patterns to be shared, stored, recalled, and adapted, enhancing possibilities for different types of scripting, quality control, knowledge transfer, etc. So this slide, this slide shows the, an example of a pattern for identifying overheating in a school building. So patterns can be recorded at different levels from planning up to the effect of different types of occupancy. And we want to open a discussion with you on recording patterns related to occupancy behavior. So these patterns can again be recorded at different levels and organized into families, such as for instance, a phase in delivery process, climate and culture, building type, potentially even user types, 
environmental ambition of the building, if it's going to be zero carbon, naturally ventilated, etc. Modeling domain and type of occupant interaction, intelligent systems, manual control, and so on. So we could start by producing a template to capture information from case studies that are produced in the annex. And here you have some uh, of the previous work on this area, which is generic to the design problem process, but can be adapted to capture uh, the interaction between user behavior and design. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clarice. Um, we'll go on to the next presenter, that is Tian Sen Hong, uh, presenting Is a Zero Net Energy Home Really Zero Net Energy? Uh, we cannot hear you, Tian Sen. I don't think if you might have your microphone muted. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> no so, problem. Uh, so this is a work about looking at zero net energy buildings, which is required for new residential construction uh, starting this January in California. And then for commercial buildings, I think it's also required by 2030, about 10 years from now. So. I think one of the research question is uh, looking at, you know, these CNE homes are designed using simulation to help optimize, you know, technologies, right? And using like a static set of assumptions about, you know, climate data, about occupants, uh, energy use behavior. So we know in reality, those two things change, right? Dynamic and complexity as Alicia just illustrated. So we want to look at how those uh, impact the actual performance of a CNE home. So we know the occupant behavior is a significant factor in freezing building performance. So we did this uh, case study, basically looking at three typical uh, climate in, in, in California, San Francisco, mild climate, Fresno, and Riverside. And this is a single family home, as the, the, the figure illustrates. So uh, a methodology we're looking at, like uh, you know, the, the last uh, 30 years actual weather data, as well as the future climate scenarios, you know, based on IPCC uh, predictions. And then we also define three types of occupant behavior. You know, usually those assumptions use a current standards, we call it standard, and there's an energy austerity style and energy wasteful style. So this is sort of provide scenario for us to look at. So uh, this is the, the design of a GNE home. I see you, I don't go through in detail, but you can see at the bottom, this is 3.4 kilowatt of PV, this on-site generation, and this is for climate Fresno. And the appliances are Energy Star, you know, very high efficient cooling system with a CS16 and, and, and can, you know, the gas furnace, a 92.5% you know, efficiency, you know, so high performance windows, LED lighting, as you can see, right, this is a GNE home. So this is table summarized the key assumptions about the three uh, occupant, uh, you know, behavior style, right? I think in the middle is the energy austerity and to the right is energy wasteful. So those are heating, cooling, set point, as well as operation, appliance use, lighting, as well as hot water use. So lighting, you know, I, I think the, the code basically require LED, but the energy austerity means uh, that uh, lights is on only when people feel dark. And that's usually about when the illuminance is less than 300 lux. So the water consumption, we assume, you know, the energy waste for basically use about double the water, you know, taking bath, you know, all those kind of, you know, water consumptions. So one result here, this is breakdown by the three climate, but take San Francisco as an example. So the horizontal uh, break dot lets the on-site PV generation. So the standard you can see, right, that's about Eco, so that's a GNE home. So energy uh, austerity basically means, right, then you have margin, basically that's a energy reduction about 20% from the standard consumption, but energy waste for basically doubles the energy consumption. So your GNE home may not be actually GNE, right, if a, a energy use is, you know, a waste for style. And I think other climate uh, shows the similar, you know, uh, pictures. 
we also looking at the, the, the weather impact. So this basically for each uh, energy style, we shows the variations of the energy use across the 30 years, right? So I, I think for the austerity, you know, for some years, you know, it may not be ZNE, but you know, it, it's it's good. And and for the, I think San Francisco, because it's not requiring for cooling. So I think it's on the positive side. While the other climate, you know, that requires more uh, cooling, for example, Fresno and Riverside, you may see some risk that ZNE would not be a real ZNE, you know. So uh, impact of climate, and I think going to the future, right, because the uh, weather warms up. So uh, for example, San Francisco would need less heating and, and hopefully the cooling is not triggered. So basically you see a positive performance in ZNE, right? And for Riverside and Fresno, then it's a more, much more complicated because right, you, you need more cooling but less heating. But in general, you know, the, the ZNE will not be maintained if you will going to the future uh, in you know, 2045 or 2075. So the conclusion is, I think these two factor influence performance and the idea is we need to consider these in a design. So we evaluate maybe the PV, you know, needs to be larger in order to, to handle all the different types of complexity and uncertainty. But uh, that's my uh, key message. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in the meantime, before the next presenter, if I can remind everybody to use the Q&A panel, um, just write your questions there and also upvote those that you think are most important. So we'll go to our next presenter, Marika Vele, uh, presenting on demand response events in residential buildings, no notice, not noticeable at all. Yes, hi all. Uh, my name is Marika and I'm a postdoc at La Rochelle University, where I'm trying to understand how occupants respond to demand response events in residential buildings. Uh, so I'm interested in demand response events controlled by smart thermostat, uh, uh, which aims to uh, change the space heating patterns. So when a smart thermostat is activated for demand response, it induces some changes in the indoor temperature. So the acceptance of demand response depends on how the comfort of the occupants is affected by this dynamic uh, indoor condition. So at the end of the day, we want to, what we want to model is uh, uh, how occupants react to, to these demand response events by adjusting the thermostats. So at the beginning of our project, we put a lot of effort on trying to better understand and modeling dynamic thermal perception. And for this, we created a new modeling approach, which is based on the updated version of three existing well-known models. Uh, if you want to know more about this uh, model, you can look at our recent uh, uh, Windsor uh, paper. Uh, but this was part of a bigger uh, modeling framework where we are simulating occupant stochastic activity and we are simulating how occupants react to um, adjust the thermostat with an agent based thermostat model, which include the dynamic thermal comfort model. And, but today I want to focus on a small application of our new dynamic thermal comfort model. Um, in our day life, in our, in our homes, we engage in different kinds of activities. So we are, we are experiencing, experiencing a different metabolic rates. So we ask ourselves whether the, the dynamic thermal comfort condition induced by these changes in metabolic rates are of the same magnitude than the dynamic conditions induced by changes in air temperature during demand response events. And for this, for doing this, uh, we simulated different occupants in different homes, we simulated the stochastic metabolic rates, and we look at the discomfort in terms of dynamic thermal sensation and dynamic percentage of dissatisfied, and this is just an example. And we compare this uh, discomfort condition with the discomfort condition induced by different kinds of demand response events. And we, this is again an example of a demand response event, and we could see that actually depending on the demand response event or some demand response events, the discomfort condition were really comparable with the discomfort condition caused by uh, changes in metabolic rate. And then of course people have the possibility to adjust uh, and to adapt behaviorally to this discomfort. So this was very dense, but if you want to know uh, more about our work, you can contact us, you can look at our website, you can even download our novel model in our Git depository. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was perfectly on time. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll go to our last but not least presenter, uh, that's Benjamin Holz, presenting on occupant behavior and SAP, integration of stochastic occupancy modeling into compliance tools. 
Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Yeah, it's a great opportunity to be here. Um, I thought I'd use the opportunity to um, introduce myself and introduce my PhD, which is in its early stages. So um, I'm a first year PhD student at Liverpool University, and I'm being supervised by Dr. Stephen Firth and Professor Kevin Lomas. I'm a student at Nolilo CDT, which specialises in research of energy demand in the built environment. And my MRES, which I did last year, was to develop a data-driven Markov model for occupancy presence in residential buildings. The aim of uh, my PhD is to take this further and to apply the Markov model to different occupant behaviours and integrate these into a compliance tool to evaluate the benefits and the applications of using these modeling techniques for occupant behaviour. It's really to see how well these do perform in compliance tools and if they can actually have some good potential applications. And the objectives are to evaluate how sensitive SAP is to occupant behaviour, to identify and develop those stochastic modeling techniques suitable for integrating to SAP, and finally to evaluate how well they perform and what kind of benefit that there is to using this type of method. So to get into some introduction in SAP, SAP is the Standard Assessment Procedure, which is a compliance tool used in UK building regulations and estimates the energy demand of a dwelling, which is used to produce energy performance certificates and rate the energy performance of dwellings. However, as shown by the graph, there is a large variance between the estimated and the actual de energy demand. And this uncertainty can be caused by a number of different reasons, uh, such as poor, poor construction, changes between design and construction, uh, but it's also caused by occupant behavior. And, and the variation in occupant behavior, which exists across the demographics which live in house, houses. Um, currently, SAP uses standard and simple occupant behavior assumptions. And so by using more detailed occupant behavior, um, we could sort of bring out that variation in, in occupant behavior. So and some initial work has gone into developing a SAP model in Python. And uh, this SAP model, uh, offers the flexibility to change the inputs and to integrate parts into, into the model um, and really change things about. Um, and this is accessible through GitHub. Um, this is a, a, big, a big task and it's, it's, it, the plan is to have this open source and available for other researchers to use um, once we know that the model is working correctly, once it's been tested. Um, and the SAP model essentially runs through all the calculations required to estimate the annual energy demand of a dwelling. Um, and it works quite well. Um, and then finally, to go through the sort of the next steps of the PhD, um, there's going to be some data collection from various sources to gather the appropriate data for different occupant behaviours. So um, data set from data sets such as time use survey data. And the data will be used to produce these distributions of demand on a monthly basis, which shows the occupancy profiles um, for each of the different occupant behaviours. And then integrating these into SAP, uh, the output will be an energy demand distribution which shows the um, annual energy uh, calculation, but it also shows that, that variation uh, as caused by open behavior. Um, and it's this uncertainty which is going to be looked at to see how this can be used, what kind of potential applications there could be, um, such as in building stock modeling and in policy um, analysis. And that's that. And then my conclusion basically summarizes the fact that uh, SAP um, uses these standard assumptions, uh, great representation will be achieved with stochastic modeling techniques such as the Markov model. Um, and these uncertainty levels will represent that variation in energy demand as a result of occupant behavior. Thank you for listening. Great, thank you very much, Benjamin. Uh, now we'll go and take questions from attendees. <clears throat> so we have a question to the first presenter, Miklos, who was working on profiling behavior from smart meter data. The question is, can you give a bit more information about the process of getting access to this data set? Um, the data set is shareable to reproduce results? So uh, it's, it's a really interesting question. So I would say that um, it's a bit of a sensitive matter. So basically, when we were uh, starting uh, to write this project proposal, we contacted um, the company which was uh, responsible for installing the smart meters and they were open to to have some data analysis done um, and uh, they agreed to to help us uh, but the problem is that their project is over so it is very hard uh, to get any additional information from them so we had to uh, sign a confidentiality agreement with them so 
Uh, it is naturally possible to share the data. However, we are open to, to uh, some common projects or common, common research and, uh, and uh, that way possibly we can, we can share some data. Uh, also in my presentation, I have mentioned that we had a lot of problem with the GDPR uh, as for the residential buildings. So that one we, we also really need to be um, careful about. However, um, getting any more data from a, a partner whose project has been closed and basically there is also just a few people working uh, there um, at this uh, moment, uh, it's very hard. But uh, in case if there is like any um, uh, possibility to, to further um, analyze the data and and uh, to have some international cooperation like we might be able to to get uh, some additional information from them as currently we are um, searching for data on the actual addresses of the of the non-residential buildings mm. as well as uh, we first got uh, only uh, what kind of acti activities uh, they are doing there, but they were also like just giving uh, us it in codes. So, so it's really hard uh, to process and it's, it's a really um, huge bottleneck of our project. Um, and if I can add a quick question to, to this question on the data set, um, how, how was um, this data, the houses sampled? Um, basically, so when they were installing the smart meters, uh, they were trying to get um, uh, as many um, measurement points as they could. So they were searching um, uh, for uh, participants through uh, a tender. And uh, as you could see on the map of, uh, of Hungary, there were just a few utility companies which were like really into this. And that's why it's not really representative. So, so yeah. they just wanted to test how they can, they can install different type of uh, measurement devices and also like how they can store uh, um, large uh, data sets, but they were not actually interested in the buildings. And that's why uh, we are focusing on that if we have limited access to to actual um, building data, but we have access to to consumption data. So how we can derive conclusions only from uh, the measured data without uh, knowing uh, too much about the buildings. So that's why we are trying all this like clustering and uh, and data filtering as well. To, to, to see if there's, for example, if there's uh, hot water uh, production based on natural gas or it is uh, based on electricity. So we need to somehow um, uh, deduce this conclusion based on the measured data. And it's, uh, uh, it's I guess, it's um, sort of, I would say for me, it's the beauty of this project. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, we'll move on. Uh, you are muted, Victoria. Sorry. Sorry, I did it again. <laughs> Thank you for the for your answer. We'll move on to a question for Adeshir Madavi. Uh, it says validation is a known weakness of agent-based modeling, due to so many degrees of freedom for even simple models. What would a credible validation protocol look like? Simple question. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I can talk about what I wish how the situation would be. I, mean, I, can, I can picture an ideal scenario. In the ideal scenario, we would have a rich database of information about occupants uh, collected for different type of buildings, for different type of use cases, for different type of climates. And we have this information, so to speak, in the backbone of a validation infrastructure. And if someone would develop a model, this model would for example, be provided in terms of a round robin test or something like that, so that an independent entity would look at this model and would say, okay, how this model, which is developed maybe based on a set of local data, would, uh, would uh, function when we would uh, benchmark it against this uh, universal data. That would mean also that that model would have to have certain, uh, let's say, devices for 
statisticians or whatsoever that would say, look, you have collected the underlying data is for this type of building, for this type of typology, for this type of demographic, this type of cultural background. And what we assume that certain coefficients can be uh, manipulated such that this model can be also exported to some, some other condition. That would be, so to speak, an ideal scenario. And from that, we could maybe derive a protocol. But the reality, of course, I'm conscious uh, about that fact that we have neither that type of universal database uh, with this type of coverage and comprehensiveness, nor the people who develop this model right now have the, so to speak, the underlying basis to develop such type of coefficients that would adjust the model. Well, what at least we could do, we could do two things. First of all, a very primitive thing we could do is not to, not to uh, say that our models are validated. I mean, even we didn't have, you know, set of original data to, you know, to, to look at it. So you, you could at least ask that for the model developers to say in which way the, the type of uh, information, the type of behavioral data that we have uh, fed into the model, where does it come from? From a more, maybe, uh, so to speak, higher level of observation, I would say we also should maybe move away to make the standard of validation correct prediction. Because I think in our context, in our business, this is pretty much a non-starter. For example, energy performance of a building on a long-time horizon. But we would say, can the proposed model properly capture certain uh, attributes of the data pertaining, for example, to distribution uh, attributes, variance of the data? Is this model capable to do that? Because if it is, then you, you could use it not for the purpose of prediction per se, but in order to, for example, check the robustness of our designs or our operational regimes and to say, okay, if we run this model many times, will we uh, figure out that there are certain scenarios in which, for example, our design is not working very well? To conclude that, for example, I know from colleagues who work in the area of a fire safety or evacuation uh, processes, they can actually use this model to figure out if a certain design might have flaws, then in maybe 5% of the cases could be problematic. So that's a different, so to speak, standard of validation, not purely prediction, but the test of the variance of the data in order to look at the contingencies. I think that would be a good, uh, good target. Thank you very much. That's a very interesting um, answer. Um, I have a question for Tian Sen Hong. Um, it says, what is the future of zero net energy? Which kind of technology can contribute in high weights and how to overcome overcooling and overheating of HVAC now? A uh, good question. I think so. The the simulation results shows the occupant have you know significant impact on the actual performance of CNE homes. So I think one of the key points from the, the occupant's uh, behavior perspective is, you know, we need to design our homes or buildings to be more, you know, uh, interactive with occupants, uh, which means you know through some smart sensing, like if there's no people at home. You know, we can turn off the lights, maybe turn off some appliances, depends on how critical they are, but also reset the temperatures, right? So, and, and the other perspective is also thinking about the use of technology. Sometimes some technology may be, you know, too complicated or need lots of maintenance and calibration. So those will not work very well in reality. We have to look at, you know, from a people's perspective. So I think that that's, uh, you know, technology itself, uh, high efficient, but also needs to be friendly for users to understand and coupled with, you know, smart sensing, you know, and, and you know, those are probably uh, key to, to the GNE e homes, you know, going to the future. Of course, I think the other dimension is, uh, you know, educate the occupants so that they're aware of as the mechanical envelope of all those aesthetic, you know, efficiencies getting to, to, to extreme. I think what we behave is very important and that significant influence the energy use. Thank you very much for that. Um, I would like to ask a question to all of the presenters. Um, so how do you feel that your research relates um, to the other 
presentations that, that were in this session. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to take the floor first. Whether you feel you can contribute, if you see a space uh, for contributing between each other and how that, do they relate to each other? Um, I think uh, I particularly find interesting relationships between the research that Clayton showed and also um, the per I can't remember his name now, sorry, from Virginia Tech. So because they were all talking about personas and the idea of recording occupancy behavior in, 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 in this format of personas, I think would be can be very informative, especially for designers and for decision makers, because if you, you, you ultimately have to look at this also from the perspective of decision makers, not only to understand behavior, but also what to do with, with this recorded behavior. And uh, I can see that there is a lot of gaps on understanding behavior, but uh, maybe we should try to find different types of this behavior so that it can be useful to decision makers. So I thought their work related to personas and these ideas of trying to create this modular uh, occupants was very interesting and I think can inform uh, subtask three very well. Thank you. Um, and I have some, I think we can take more questions of some, somebody else uh, wants to add something on this. I'd like to add actually, uh, just quickly for uh, the work that Mikolos um, mentioned, like in, in terms of um, deriving occupants uh, data from from low, from smart meter data or from existing mm -hmm. databases. I think that would be a good build up on what we're doing. And one of the things I wanted to ask you is if you're looked into load disaggregation by any means, like trying to uh, to see this electricity meter data that you have, if you can try to attribute it to different end uses, or uh, is there any way that you could uh, could have any thoughts on that, let's say? Well, um, the, um, the problem with this is that, um, as I mentioned, we uh, don't know much about the buildings. So mm -hmm. we can add a few um, assumptions, like for example, in case of uh, domestic hot water um, production, so based on the natural gas data or based on the electricity data, if there is some base load, uh, we can we can allocate something, but it's it's uh, really hard to to really uh, distinguish between the end users. So right. so the um, the good part of this data set that it's it's really huge. The bad mm -hmm. part of it is that we don't really know much about Not the buildings the that they are installed yeah. in them. Yeah. That's uh, that's the hard part. Yeah. Did um, both of you, both Mohammed and Miklos? Did you find um, any particular problems with the resolution of the data? So was there a minimum resolution that you needed um, to, to do your analysis or mm -hmm. what were your findings on this? I, I, like if I would answer first, I, I, well, the resolution was good with the ECOB data. If you, if you look at it, it's a five minute resolution, quite uh, maybe the resolution of some of the measurements and stuff, there, there are some issues. So there are some data missing, some data that have errors and um, the reported temperatures. So for a different analysis, we were trying to look at the uh, decay in indoor temperature. And, and for that, just having a one degree Fahrenheit resolution versus more detailed in terms of measurements that would have been better. But in terms of time resolution or uh, temporal resolution, I think it was okay. Uh, but you always have those issues and we have to exclude a lot of houses for different uh, reasons. Um, that's to answer at least on, on our side, I can see, yeah. Well, for, for us, uh, the main, main um, uh, thing is that if you if you look at electricity data, for example, that uh, you can allocate some of the uses, uh, like how you use electricity. But for example, in case of uh, metered uh, natural gas, uh, it's really hard to to evaluate, for example, heating just from the natural gas consumption because you you just have some peaks. Uh, we had a case where we couldn't even determine like how the heating system was working. Uh, even though we had like 15 minutes um, measured gas data, so we couldn't really do anything with it. So I would say that uh, the resolution really, the time-wise re resolution, it really depends on which type of data you are uh, looking at and what is the purpose mm -hmm. of 
your research. Like the more you know about the building, the more you know about your consumers in a way, uh, it's better to have more detailed data. But as soon as you go into uh, more uh, uncertain areas regarding your building, so you don't really know your building or buildings, then uh, uh, you can't really use high resolution data because in the end you would just end up making averages or summing up for let's say five minute data to one hour or even daily data because you wouldn't be able to 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 allocate uh proper consumption patterns to them so thank you very much yes just want to add something just in terms of um, like relevancies with other researchers i think what uh, tianzan also presented was quite relevant especially when you know we're trying to look at the impact on net zero energy code and his his work on the zero net energy homes so one of the things i just wanted to clarify maybe i missed it in the presentation was the three categories or the three scenarios you're looking at was that somewhat arbitrary or was that based on uh, certain data sets or Anything so for that austerity, wasteful, and uh, baseline? Yeah, Mohan, Mo thank you for the question. I think uh, so, so the standard behavior or the average behavior, I think basically those are the assumptions in the code and mm -hmm. standards, right? And I think the other two, so we sort of uh, review some literatures. I think mm -hmm. actually we have an article on these work under review. So some are based on a literature review, like those are typical, and some are from some you know limited measurements, like mm -hmm. you have data from ECOB. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that's uh, yeah. It's interesting that we see the impact being stronger with with occupants, especially with doing at energy homes. So I think there's a mm -hmm. lot to that. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. I think we still have lots of questions left, but we are already on time. So I invite all the presenters to go through the questions later on. And if you want to get in touch with those people that have asked the question. And now I think I uh, will give the floor to Stephanie um, and Bakker for the closing remarks of the day. And really thank you very much to, to all the presenters in this session. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Victoria. Thanks also to the chairs for these sessions. I think I'll give the, uh, the podium to Stephanie, if you can stand on the podium and summarize the day for us, and then I'll say a few words at the end. Okay, thank you, Becca. So, um, thank you for um, all the, um, the speakers. Um, it was, um, thank you for all attending. Uh, you know, uh, we had on that at peak, we had 132 attendees um, and at the last session, 107. Um, so it's, a, it's really fantastic. You're really reaching out to a much wider audience. Um, so maybe an online event, maybe uh, that's, uh, you know, once a year, uh, you know, instead of a physical event. Um, for every six months might be a way forward to be a bit more uh, more inclusive so that's fantastic thank you to uh, for all the speaker and for all the attendee for uh, as well as the question answer um i really like the the discussion session specifically uh, the uh, the part of the first session shared by Baka on um speaker and um panelist uh, having a quite a rich discussion about the topic and if I can just summarize a um, few remarks uh, that be by uh, Michael Kane for me a key point of the day was what is the re um, relationship between occupants and the control system so the first session was really on the um, focus on the occupant so there's a model around the occupant um, and which variable may be at play when we talk about occupant and comfort. Uh, compared to the, um, going on to the, the second station where more about control systems. Um, so we, it's really, um, and I would say the, um, the presentation by Philippe Aguy um, was really putting this um, kind of two type of model um, in, you know, a question, which one should we follow or should we um, look at them, um, you know, I com as combining them. Um, so I think that was really interesting. 
Um, again, a, um, a point by Clarice just made earlier about a, the recording the persona and the modular occupant, again, um, picked up by um, Tianzin Hong on his presentation. And I find it uh, quite interesting on, on um, looking at a um, typology of occupant. And that was picked up as well by all the um, analysis methods that were used, notably um, cluster analysis of source, came in of sort, or hierarchical model. And you can just find kind of like profiling of occupant, which is quite nice as well to see and the different, exploring different techniques and models that we had in the last session with um, a point as well on agent base, which was really, really interesting discussion. So thank you, everybody. I hope you will um, to see you tomorrow. We have a second session again on um, modeling and then followed by um, uh, occupant related research, but other research. And I find the title of Liam's uh, presentation, how uh, does teleworking save energy? Um, that was actually an abstract I submitted about two months ago. So it's really topical and really interesting. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to listening to Liam tomorrow um, at uh, 1.25. And then we've got a case study, um, great presentation, um, Marianne as well on um, acoustic comfort and multi um, unit residential building. I'm looking forward to, to this one as well. So um, yes, thank you for the day. And I'm looking forward to see you tomorrow. I'll, I'll leave the floor to Baka to formally close the session today. Thank you. I can't hear you. Baka, I am. Um, oh, you're you? muted. Bakar, we still cannot hear you. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Right. We are share this again. So can you um can you see the screen now? Yep. Can you see the screen? Yes. Yeah, great. Okay. So basically these are the panelist speakers that we took some uh, screen grabs from uh, from today. Uh, what we really wanted to do is to take a screen grab of everybody who were attending. We had 133 this morning and currently we only have what, 100, we have 88 participants, we've gone down by 20. So we'll try and do that tomorrow to get some screen grabs of everybody because that will be part of the output from the symposium uh, and also part of the record for the Annex 78 uh, meeting. And um, the last bit is that Stephanie already said that this is day two tomorrow. Uh, we're going to start again by registration and then followed by uh, the four sessions at the end, uh, with one of them being just closing remarks. And it should be really 10 minutes rather than 30 minutes. Uh, I thank you again. On behalf of all the team in Southampton, and I thank you for your patience if the uh, technology did not work. But up on the whole, I think we've done quite well with the technology. Uh, and this is the first time for us to try. So again, thanks very much. And I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow, hopefully with more people. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Victoria. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, Bye. Can, I, can I just ask uh, chairs and hosts to just stay on the line, please? Is that for tomorrow or for today? Well, it, it, it's uh, to discuss uh, a bit tomorrow. There's a few learnings. Bakar, I think we need to get you a new microphone. <laughs> Sorry? I think we need to get you a new microphone. <laughs> well, I, I actually changed computers as well. So, ah. so it's not, it's, I thought I would do better with this. So because before really we could hear, I mean, other times that we, we did Teams meeting or something, it was fine. It was right. only today.
Um, Maybe the best thing to do is to exit I've got this a, process to come in again, uh, Philip. Okay, yep, that's fine. Uh, what we can do on Teams, because uh, I know Stephanie's got to go as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, thank you everybody that's still in the uh, attendees panel, and we look forward very much to tomorrow's sessions. Thank you. Bye-bye. We're all gone. <laughs>